I know it hasn't been too much. Uh, I'm from the east side of the eastern time, so it's weird that this is morning still. I'm used to this being called afternoon. But uh, seeing emails from my coworkers at 6 a.m., like, well, everyone got up early. <laughs> time zones are like that, I guess. But uh, just to get an idea, how many of you are kind of from the Las Vegas area? <laughs> wow, right? We are in Las Vegas. <laughs> that's that's not what I'm used to seeing. Suburb of LA. So, uh, how many of you are more from uh, West Coast side of things? Not too bad. <laughs> kind of kind of Central U.S. <laughs> Solid East East side. West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see such a diverse crowd. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the conference will go well for everyone. And Thank you very much for coming and listening to this presentation. Today we're going to talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a, a topic that I think is really, really cool and very, very relevant. Um, all so often we're seeing companies deploying full disk encryption and people using it on their personal machines too. But a lot of the problem I see uh, with implementations of full disk encryption is we see encryption as this magical black box that just solves all our problems. It's encrypted. We're good. We don't have to worry about anything. But the plain fact is, full disk encryption, like any other security technology, it can and is vulnerable to different forms of attacks. And there's things that we can do better than just enabling it and setting it and forget it, so to speak, uh, to better protect it. And uh, I'm going to cover both sides of the coin, the uh, ways that you can attack a full disk encrypted system, and also ways that you can better defend these systems to protect that information and ultimately protect your company's uh, company's data, your company's intellectual property. So without further ado, just a, a little bit about myself. I'm a, a security engineer at Hurricane Labs, which is a Cleveland-based uh, security company. Uh, we're an MSP that does everything from checkpoint support, well, management, uh, network monitoring, all, all the full nine yards. So um, get to get my hands into a whole bunch of different things, monitor systems uh, across the world, across our customers. And it's been a great experience. Prior to joining Hurricane Labs, I was a student at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, studied uh, computing security and information insurance for my master's. Um, kind of focus on forensics and uh, data storage for uh, some of my research in that area, as well as being a graduate assistant. And for undergrad on that, I studied applied networking system administration. So I have the security and the kind of the networking side of the coin. What really got me into security was the CCDC competition. Do we have people who've participated in that before? It's good to, good to see a couple. Wearing uh, a shirt right now. Yeah, I can't quite see that, but. Yeah, that's because it's like five years old, so it's dark green on black. <laughs> hey, you know, color, colors work like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why we're security people, not art majors. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that kind of really set me into the mind back, mindset of what it's like to defend systems and what, what it's really like to get attacked constantly and the kind of way I kind of see it is it's my job now and my life is CCDC every day almost so that's there's good and bad things with that but it's definitely never a dull day for sure um, just to kind of get a, a feel for the audience and get everyone thinking about this topic how many of you currently uh, and this is my big sure everyone's awake how many of you have worked for a company or personally use a laptop <laughs> hey, good. You guys are awake. How many of you, uh, either part of the as part of your company's deployment, either require full disk encryption or have it deployed on at least a set of systems? That's probably why you're here. Good. Uh, how many of you is it mandatory on every laptop system in your organization? <laughs> Still a pretty good size, I would say, probably about two thirds. Um, how many of you? We'll do that on your personal machines as well. Pretty good. I expected that to be a little bit less uh, than the company mandate, just because it's it's different. But it, it was a slight different set of the crowd, but still about two thirds, which is good to see. Uh, how many of you, or in your organization, uh, require this on other machines like desktops? I don't expect to see as many. Okay, but there are some people who do that on their desktops. What about servers? Is there anyone who's making servers at full display? One person, or two person, three people. What, what are the reasons for doing servers? Uh, that's just something that isn't common. Protect uh, 
one of the things that we constantly talk about in this industry is the whole idea of verification. Uh, the problem I see all too often, especially with uh, the management <coughs> side, is you'll see security as just a checkbox. Okay guys, for this audit, for PCI compliance, for HIPAA compliance, we need to have full disk encryption. That's what your auditor says. You deploy full disk encryption, you get a checkbox. You have full disk encryption, you pass. Unfortunately, a lot of the times we don't do that. And that brings up the important concept of trust but verify. And I know I've heard this once already today and you'll probably hear it throughout uh, the conference. Um, the whole idea of trust but verify to make sure that what you're deploying does what it says it does and also try to attack something and try to see where the vulnerabilities exist in whatever you're testing. Uh, there's two ways that this can be done in the case of disk uh, forensics or even in forensic penetration testing um, where you would, uh, first you'd have a zero knowledge attack where let's just say a laptop was stolen, you know nothing about the organization, the thing could even be powered off. Uh, it's just there, nothing about, no passwords, nothing like that and you just try to see what you can do knowing nothing about the machine at all. That would be a zero knowledge attack. Uh, you can also do a more authenticated approach where you can simulate certain scenarios. Uh, say, for example, the machine was powered out when it was running. Uh, what kind of, how does that throw into the equation? Uh, but the whole idea is you want to be able to do this like any other test that you would do on any other system. We have penetration tests for a reason. You want to find problems in your environment before the bad guys find them. Um, same thing for something like full disk encryption. Identify the shortcomings before they become problems. That being said, Pretty much everyone here has some way, shape, or form that they're deploying full disk encryption. Let's just say that there's a laptop in your organization that was stolen. Uh, it could be yours right now. How many of you can say with confidence <coughs> that that data is not able to be recovered? So we had almost everyone deployed encryption, and only two people are able to say that. Next question, how can you say that? Good. How many of here can say that they think they're pretty good? I, I, I really expected more. <laughs> so, I, so we all say, you know, like, we all suck, you know, we should just go home. No. <laughs> but uh, there always is room for improvement, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, since he thinks he's pretty good, he deserves a shirt, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so. That being said, yeah, uh, it's really, really, most of us can't say without a shadow of a doubt or at least have some independent verification that yes, our encryption deployment is vetted and it's safe. So quite frankly, from what I'm getting from the audience here, we've deployed encryption. We think, so it's we think it solves the problem, but we don't know for sure. Is that kind of the general consensus that I'm, I'm getting from this room? I see, I see some nods and I see some no's, so I guess we'll just keep barging forward and we'll see, we'll see how this goes. And this is the part that everyone who does any kind of talking at a security conference, they want to talk about the, the hacking into things, the breaking stuff. It's the sexy part of security, quite frankly. But attacking full disk encryption. Um, the plain fact is, breaking encryption is hard. They don't, uh, unless of course someone's coming up with their own encryption, and in a lot of cases that's not really encryption at all, they're just doing some kind of encoding or not. But pretty much everyone is using some form of AES, and that's not just something that someone's gonna say, okay, I'm gonna break this tomorrow. It, it exists for a reason, it's not easy to break encryption. So in that case, a lot of times as a security researcher, as an attacker, as a pen tester, you're looking for the weakest link. I like to think of the uh, XKCD comment that comic on trying to break into an encrypted system. Uh, they present the idea of, okay, this is encrypted. Let's spend millions of dollars on the supercomputer to crack the encryption. And they're like, okay, but it's this form of encryption. We're not gonna be able to do it anyway. But we still have this cluster, so we can just try to crack it anyway. What really happens, the other side of the comic on the right side, 
You spend five dollars on a wrench and torture the person until they give up their password. <laughs> Which is a problem that we as an industry face. The technology is very, very good a lot of times. But the people using it or some other aspect of it, something very, very simple. Something Stone Age, so to speak. You don't need a wrench. You can just pick up a rock on the ground and to accomplish the same thing. Zero budget, and you don't even have to worry about approval and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, but something like that, it's really, really simple. Anyone can do it, and what you spent all this time and money and effort on can be rendered absolutely worthless. And it's a problem that we face. But I, I don't want to look at this from a perspective of we're going to try to prevent users from giving up information when they're tortured, because that's not really a problem that we're here to solve. Um, but the whole idea of, as a, someone who's trying to break into something, we, we've got to think outside the box a lot of times. And full disk encryption is no exception. So I want to jump a little to story time with Tom here. Um, this is kind of an example of an actual forensics penetration test that I did for one of our customers. Uh, and it kind of goes into the details of <coughs> what can be done. And obviously, the reason why I'm talking about this is not because I wasn't able to get in. Um, so to set the scene for this, there was an encrypted laptop that was stolen. And I can say this was left on you know, wherever, completely powered off, no information about the company, nothing besides here's the laptop, there's some data on it, we know it's encrypted. One would think that that's safe. Show of hands, yeah. You guys, that should be fine. Question. Yes. Which encryption, are we assuming that it's going to be full disk, not a credence we, particle encryption? We're assuming absolutely full disk. Um, there, it, it, in this case, it was semantic solution. So it's your standard oh, enterprise it. system. It, it, it's basically what you'd kind of expect from a full disk encryption mm -hmm. solution. Uh, is it decrypted boot or decrypted login? Uh, it's a supposed to be decrypted boot. <laughs> 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 Which, uh, and I'm going to get more into the details, yes, it, it initially it looked that way. Okay, TPM on or off? Uh, no TPM in this case, uh, but mm -hmm. passphrase decryption. decryption. The passphrase was a password. It was not password. <laughs> I had no idea what that was, and I did not need to know what it was. Uh, but for generally, when you think of that scenario, we're, and we're not dealing with you know, something that's powered on, that we can dump the RAM and get the encryption key and all that kind of stuff. This is a powered off system. It seems like the case for something that should not be able to get broken into. And quite frankly, when I, when I thought about this the first time I was presented with this, how am I going to do that? You have you know, the FBI. Someone comes across the border <coughs> with a laptop that in, the agents at the border see on the screen incriminating data. The person powers off the laptop. This is an actual court case. They aren't able to decrypt it. They're throwing all, you know, all the power of the NSA and the FBI at this thing to try to break the darn thing, and they can't get in. How the heck am I supposed to be able to get into this thing? The wrench. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get the wrench, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, when this machine was stolen, I, I didn't know who I stole it from, so I couldn't torture them. <laughs> Which, you know, I try to be a nice guy, but sometimes, you know, you got to do what you got to yeah, do. Usually, most company laptops have the username on a label on it somewhere. Yeah, th th for some reason, when they stole it, it blew away. <laughs> it, it, I got to talk to our project manager about that. He's Call the help desk. <laughs> that, that is an That's option, but it was not man. deployed in this case. I, and quite frankly, I, there was no information on there to indicate what company this was from. So I'd be calling every help desk, which I'd probably get some decryption keys, or some resets, but it wouldn't help too much in this case. What brand of laptop was it? It's a Dell. Take the service bank, drive a warranty information, find the company. <laughs> I like the way you think. <laughs> but, okay, so. The way we're going to kind of look at this is from a forensics penetration perspective. Uh, and I, I know I mentioned about the zero knowledge versus authenticated testing. Initially, I planned to look at this from a zero knowledge perspective. No information about the machine whatsoever. It's just there and try to get to do what I can based on that information. Authenticated testing was going to be the next step for this. 
uh, where I wanted to try to simulate different scenarios. Say, if someone left the machine, they went to the restroom, and someone tried to get the RAM, the information out of memory. Didn't actually have to do that, but in some cases, if you're trying to do a forensics penetration test for encryption verification, you'd want to look at it from both scenarios. Uh, so the real test on this fully encrypted machine, uh, the person who gave this to us for this test, they were completely confident that there wasn't any, going to be anything we'd find. And I really was skeptical too, and for most people here, uh, there is reason to believe that this should be fine. Um, the things that I noticed about this, um, got the machine, it was powered off. First thing, anything you do in a case of a forensics investigation or a forensics pen test, immediately you image the disk. You don't try to turn it on, don't try to investigate anything, you make a full disk image. You have your evidence drive that you never touch again, and then you have a working scratch disk, and that you can use to make duplicates of and work off of. So that was kind of the, the start of the process. Uh, and then once I had a working copy, uh, I started kind of seeing what was involved. So we had our standard Dell laptop, you had your standard interfaces on it, USB, parallel, uh, fireware, PCMCIA, nothing special, just your standard is a, a D520 laptop. Um, but it, the other thing to mention about when I did the clone, used a write blocker so there wasn't any chance of manipulating the original source disk at all. Which is kind of cool because, let's say for example this machine was stolen, um, you could put the drive back in, the company would have no idea what happened to. If they looked at it or even hired someone to look at it, they wouldn't see anything that would indicate the machine was tampered with. Um, I fired up the machine, you got your semantic uh, login screen, basically prompting for pre-boot authentication. So it looked like kind of pretty standard from what you'd expect. Uh, was it disk resident or was it uh, resident on uh, another part of the machine separate from the actual disk? It was disk resident. Okay. So um, I, if I put it in a different machine, for example, I would still get the same thing. Uh, if I didn't have that drive in the laptop, I could just use it as a laptop. Yeah. So it was all built into the disk. Uh, and that information was copied over when I cloned the drive. So the breakthrough, the breakthrough on this was a grace period for pre-boot authentication that existed. And the way that this was discovered was a bunch of trial and error. Uh, there was at one point when the system was used that there was a period of time where you could reboot the machine and it would not prompt for an authentication window. And the hard drive has no sense of time. So once I discovered what this was, and it took a lot of you know booting up the machine, and just this was just a stab in the dark. But as soon as you boot it up, the disk knows that it's accessed and it's locked. But going back, I was able to locate the period of time from when it was last used to when this was allowed, and that was my working window. I could clone my source disk, uh, my original state of the machine, reset the clock on the machine to that time and basically have an indefinite time of working on the system. Once you see an operating system loading on an encrypted machine, you know that there is some form of decryption taking place. And then, you don't have to worry about the de decryption. You essentially can look at the operating system itself. In this case, it was Windows XP, so you know, that happens. Not the most secure operating system, but any operating system that's running is subject to more attacks, and it's more vulnerable than something such as full disk encryption. So the whole idea of repeatedly imaging the drive to find where this window was, and quite frankly, there is a lot of luck involved in something like this, uh, but it's not something that you would necessarily expect to find either. Uh, once that was found, I could basically work on this machine indefinitely. Could you boot to any other, uh, like a live CD or a USB drive before getting to the hard drive itself? Uh, you, the way the machine was configured, you couldn't, okay. but it was just a matter of changing the BIOS. Sure. That being said, it was a Dell model where even if they change the BIOS password, they are uh, the reverse you know, master password mm -hmm. yeah. off of the service tag available for that. <coughs> so. Can you explain this window a little bit more? Is, is the, the data actually at rest encrypted or is there data Absolutely. Is there is, there, is, is there at any point where it's unencrypted? Or it's no, it, it is encrypted. If you looked at the drive during this window, it would look completely encrypted. You couldn't read anything. There was just some... Um, it was basically tying the OS authentication to the pre-boot authentication. 
kind of, in the sense of it would allow you to reboot within a certain amount of time. It was basically making it more convenient for the users. <laughs> This was semantics. I, I, when they did a retest, they used a different uh, product, and I couldn't find anything similar for that. That being said, one of the recommendations was to force freeboot authentication, and they absolutely did that. Uh, so I, any product that gives a grace period or does something that loads the operating system into memory is vulnerable. what decrypts the key, generally. So um, it seems like there's something that's causing it to unlock that, or it, there's something on there that's storing it. What exactly is going on behind the scenes, that I can't say for sure. But uh, for some reason, there would be some way to access the key, because it, obviously the machine is accessing that. Um, how that's being stored, if it's something that's unlocked with a passphrase, or if it's something that could be pulled off the drive, yeah, I, I'm not going to but obviously, once I had the machine running the operating system in this case, uh, for something forensics, obviously, you want to have the smallest amount of data to work with possibly, just because you're looking through a needle in a haystack. Okay. So in this case, you downgrade the RAM from 2 gigs to 512 megs, uh, just to make it a small working environment. And I had full control to do whatever I wanted. And uh, using the FireWire interface in the laptop, which is a DMA interface, uh, direct mem memory access, uh, and uh, that allows you to access the lower four gigs of memory without going through uh, the operating system or the CPU. It just basically is directly accessible. So I dumped the RAM in that case to have an image of memory that should have contained the encryption key. And quite frankly, that wasn't absolutely necessary because there's this tool called Inception that you can use to 
basically replaced the password check checking mechanism of the Windows OS uh, and basically bypassed that completely. So you can run this tool, it successfully replaces the code in memory, you walk up to it, type whatever administrator password you want and enter, you're logged in. It's really nice. Uh, the end result in that was full admin access to the whole system. Uh, the system was encrypted the whole time, but if you're running in an operating system that you're logged in as an admin, it really doesn't matter if the whole thing's encrypted, you can just pull whatever you want. So if that had whatever information was on that drive, I had full access to it at that point. I did this exact same thing as Dewey, but for the beginning of the license. So I, I was able to access it and directly type Dewey and just go in. The just that part of it. Yeah, they, there's def there's memory is kind of the, the, if you're dealing with full disk encryption, you kind of almost automatically have to look at memory too. Uh, they do go hand in hand. But a lot of people, and uh, this audience is not going to say this, uh, of course, because you guys are more familiar with this, they might think that, oh, our encryption failed. No, no, no. Encryption did not fail, but the implementation of it did fail. Uh, and this is one of the cases where a user convenience setting, uh, hey, I, we don't want to have to have our users type in long passwords every time they log in. It's, they just need to reboot it during the day. But one little detail like that that you don't think would cause a lot of problems it resulted in the complete failure of this whole deployment. And basically every single one of their laptops that was deployed at that point in time was vulnerable, which is a huge issue. Um, and this was a zero knowledge attack both ways. As an attacker, I didn't have to know anything about it in advance in order to get in. And if that machine was returned to them with the original drive that I manipulated nothing on, they would not know that their information was taken they would not know that their customer information could have been taken by an attacker until, of course, it showed up on Facebook. Um, which, since this was a test, it, it, it fortunately worked out well for them, but it could have been a lot worse. So now the things that kind of set the scenario of full disk encryption basically completely failing, uh, the question, how do we secure this? And that's what's, what's all in your minds right now. Most importantly, understanding the vulnerabilities. And uh, these are applicable to pretty much any full disk encryption deployment. Uh, obviously, physical access. Most of the time, the reason you're deploying encryption is physical access, because if a server is sitting on the internet, a web server, for example, typically your average attacker is not gonna drive to that data center and steal the server to get the information off of it. They're gonna do a SQL injection attack, or they're gonna do something else like that to get the information and exploit the operating system again. But in full disk encryption is more of, we have machines that people can take and we want to protect them. Uh, obviously, what goes hand in hand with people taking machines is your unintended machines. Um, something that can be stolen, obviously, is much higher risk than something that isn't going to be stolen, of course. Uh, your passphrases and your decryption keys, those are kind of the keys to the kingdom in a full disk encryption deployment. Um, passphrases and trusted users for passphrases can't always be the best thing. So getting that information is obviously going to be easier than trying to break into the encryption directly. And then you have also the memory resident information that exists whenever the machine is running. Typically when people have laptops for some reason they want to turn them on and do things. Not quite sure why. But that's an important aspect. A machine has to be running in order to be usable. So what I like to say, a system that's completely usable is completely insecure. Likewise, a system that's completely secure is completely unusable. And we have to have a balance between the two. And this comes into the case of uh, usability versus security. Uh, some of these recommendations that I'm going to have will have minor impact. And there can be something that you can go home and on Monday you can implement this. Other ones, they might be a little more drastic and harder uh, to implement in an organization. You might receive pushback from your users. And depending on what you're trying to secure and the risk of the information that are, are that is on the system that you're trying to protect, it might not be worth it. And quite frankly, that's what we must manage in security. Uh, but you really need to con consider what options are the absolute best for your deployment and kind of choose the balance that's best. So I'm not <coughs> saying to do everything, uh, but one thing I definitely am saying is pre-boot authentication is absolutely not an option. Use it, require it, anything that's a system that's going to be out there, every time it boots up, must have a pre-boot authentication password before any operating system loads, period. Otherwise, as we saw in the pen test, 
there is a chance, although remote, that that can be bypassed if that, if that window can be discovered if such a thing exists. So, reboot authentication, absolutely implement it. Now also, uh, this might be a little bit more difficult to implement, but consider disabling your DMA interfaces. In the case of the pen test, this was FireWire, but there are other interfaces that do offer DMA, uh, Express Card, PCM, CIA. Um, quite frankly, those aren't used all that often. Uh, I would say that the majority of people who have those in interfaces enabled, uh, pretty much every laptop will have something that's DMA. FireWire is obviously the most convenient, uh, but that being said, if a laptop has an expansion card, you throw a card into it, uh, through the magic of plug and play, you now have a FireWire interface that provides DMA. Don't forget Thunderbolt. Yes, Thunderbolt is a big one, uh, and it, that definitely has the same vulnerabilities as well. So, And that one is, since it's a display port as well, people aren't really disabling that as much. So definitely something to consider. Uh, and I don't even know if there's a good way on a Mac to disable that. Uh, a lot of your corporate laptops, they have the BIOS options to turn that off. And the plain fact is, is I know BIOS passwords and all that can't be worked around in most laptops. But what you're doing is by disabling those interfaces, you're forcing someone trying to break in to have the machine powered off in order to do that or access the BIOS. Because it's very rare to be able to change BIOS settings within an operating system. I know there's ways to do that as well. But quite frankly, most frequently you're gonna be doing that with the machine powered off and in the BIOS. At that point, you reset the information that's in memory you don't make that something that someone can just grab easily. Uh, but the, the thought on the DMA interface is, for most of your users, I would be willing to say that they're not required, and it's something that can be disabled. Uh, the exceptions would be, say, FireWire for your digital cameras and digital video capture. Uh, Thunderbolt, like uh, he mentioned. I, I think he deserves a shirt for that one. <laughs> I'm gonna... So do you think uh, it's really worth the loss of convenience to uh, working there when all you gotta do is take the disc out of the computer and get another one? I mean, even if you... Well, to take a disc out of a computer, there's no memory that's transferred. So if the disc is encrypted, um, yeah. you, once you take out the disc, basically, you're, you're, the attacker gains nothing. Oh, you're talking about just to, to get it installed on. So it can yeah, it yeah, so if the interface is disabled by default, someone steals the machine and it's still on it, they can't get to that memory information, you've essentially protected that system from that kind of attack. Upside down, and there. Let me, don't get me started on that. That is really, really, really hard. I, I, I've tried to do the, 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 the cold boot stuff, and <laughs> I, it sounds awesome to be able to, to do that. I've never been able to uh, implement it successfully. Uh, trying across different machines, trying you know the exactly what they say using various tools, it's it's never been something I've been able to pull off. And if you're ever in a situation where you're considering that, you better damn well try every other option first before you try a cold boot, right. because it's it it's like slim to none that you're ever going to pull that off. Uh, that's just being being realistic. Um, other options is disabling standby, and also understanding the risk of hybrid. Standby, essentially, a machine is powered off with RAM completely activated and containing all the information that's in there. So if a machine that's in standby is stolen, that information can be retrieved. And Hibernate's even nicer because a lot of times it'll just boot up the operating system and bypass your pre-boot. You make a clone of the drive, you have a working snapshot of the machine, and it's kind enough to copy the memory to the same state every time you turn it on. So as a forensics investigator trying to do a forensics penetration test on something like that, it's almost like a dream come true. So if you have something like that, if you needed to play hibernate, uh, a BIOS password or a power on password isn't really a good option because it can be bypassed. You almost wanted to look at an ATA password on the hard drive to make that drive not accessible. But then again, and that's very difficult to break into the, the actual hard drive password, but you're also bypassing the full disk encryption. So, kind of got to consider, like, on my laptop, I use the power on password, I use a supervisor password, use a hard drive password, and an encryption key, and I think I'm okay. <laughs> but <laughs> there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of different things to, to consider. 
Also, the management side of things, uh, users are going to forget their passwords and their passphrases. And someone, there's got to be some way to get around this because users don't like to hear, well, you like that, Dad? I'm sorry. You, you're not going to get that back. Um, which might be an option, but uh, most of the time you have a help desk that's going to deal with password resets. And quite frankly, they can be vulnerable to social engineering. Uh, and if, say for example, the same uh, master password is used across an organization, I've seen this happen. Uh, someone gets that, and you can decrypt every laptop in the company uh, without any problems. So you just need to get that. Um, then it would just be a matter of making sure your help desk does not just give these out freely, and also that stolen machines are reported immediately, which is difficult to do. And backups. And backups are always good. I, I, anyone who says backup, I, I'm not going to give you another shirt, but <laughs> you, anyone who says backups, if someone else says backups, I'll give them a shirt. Sure. Yeah, backups. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm back for the magic word. There we go. Backups, backups are always good. Uh, and also the policy issue, uh, leaving machines attended w unattended while they're powered on. Um, someone walks away to the restroom, uh, you as the sneaky attacker type can uh, just plug into their firewall port, assuming they didn't listen to the rest of this presentation, basically get into their operating system, copy whatever information you want off of the machine, lock the machine when you walk away, they'll come back and nothing happens. Uh, so some laptops actually have the option, uh, the tough books for example, where you can physically take the drive out of the machine whenever you have to leave it alone, as opposed to carrying the machine. That seems a lot more painful than just taking the machine with you. But uh, something like that where you just do not leave the machine powered on uh, and unattended because there is uh, a risk of that. And it all depends on what information your company has and what you're trying to protect. If there's actually uh, a risk where whatever information on your machine, you have actively people stalking your employees trying to get this information, well, that kind of sucks for them too. But you just want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And also independent verification. Um, this would be the case of where you have one company that says, hey, company A, our laptop was stolen. It had the, the database <coughs> records of 10,000 of our, employee, our, our customers on there. Uh, we have full disk encryption, so we should be fine. Or company B that says, yeah, one of our laptops was stolen. Uh, it had the information of 10,000 of our customers on it. We have full disk encryption deployed. Fortunately, this, this was verified by an independent third party penetration test, uh, and they tried a bunch of different hacks and weren't able to break into the system. So we have reason to believe that our information is secure. What company would you feel better about? Uh, company A or company B? B. B, <coughs> yes. So it at least demonstrates due diligence. Uh, and uh, having that independent verification is not something that a lot of people think about, but it is a valuable step in a, a case of something like this. So our conclusions for this talk, uh, full disk encryption, it's not bulletproof. It's not a checkbox that magically solves your problems, and it is vulnerable. That being <coughs> said, failure of encryption is something that is quite rare. Uh, the, the external factors that you need to consider, uh, the possibility of a machine being attacked through a direct memory access. Uh, something else you didn't expect, like expect, such as uh, a pre-built authentication window. But it's important to understand these risks and vulnerabilities and improve wherever possible. So with that, I'll wrap things up and uh, take some time for questions. So, so how often do you run into uh, uh, the password reset option enabled in these deployments? It's, it's pretty common, uh, just because you have remote users, and sure. a lot of times companies are valued, well, valuing the uh, the per productivity of their employees more than they're valuing the security of their data. So, so if you have a user that has to be down for a period of time at a remote site, that's often unaccept unacceptable, right. uh, and it's a risk. It's a wonderful op opportunity. Yes. What color is your car? What, was your, you know, what make was your first car? That kind of stuff. Huge. Yep. Exposure. Absolutely. So it sounds like that there's still more to be investigated, though, because just the fact that this encryption vendor has implemented this kind of capacity ability, you know, even if you set that policy to say you will always require authentication, maybe there still is a configuration file to modify the client side or just bypass that. Yep. Okay. You don't really know. And there's also options inside inside some uh, deployments where you can just run a command within the operating system to force it.
different windows, and unfortunately, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Any other questions we have? No, you didn't mention the evil maniac. Is that a threat that you consider? Can you uh, describe that for those who aren't familiar with that? Uh, if you modify the boot loader to then tell the key logger, the next time you sit in the boot, it captures the, the three boots. That is absolutely possible. Uh, unfortunately for something like that is it often breaks the operating system really badly. Uh, I know we actually, that was something that we actually tried to implement at someone at our company that we didn't like that much. Uh, <laughs> by trying to, to basically rootkit the uh, <laughs> initial loading of that to try to get their decryption key and I think they pretty much had to rebuild their laptop because someone didn't do something right. But uh, uh, definitely something like a key log logger uh, Within the bootloader, sure, that, that's completely vulnerable. Hardware keylogger would obviously be an easier way to do that, but that would be harder, or easier to detect as well, where something like you're suggesting, that would be harder. Did I give you a shirt yet? No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So what about the scenarios where you're using like a um, PKI certificate, a smart card PKI certificate like they do in the DOD? Does that change the scenario much at all because you're not relying on a password or key loggers? Or in, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh, if some, obviously, if someone's able to steal both the laptop and the card at the same time, mm -hmm. then it's a lot easier because you'll have the, both factors there, or at least one of the factors. Yeah, you wouldn't have the pin. But yeah, you wouldn't have the pin, but you'd at least have the, the harder part of it to do the pin. Assume, assuming that they couldn't use the card because of the pin, is there still... Does it close some loops, but leave some open to get around that? It, it, it's different. So uh, I think a lot, uh, like a government situation, would be a case where it's a lot easier to enforce some of the other policies we talked about. So it, it does make it, basically, from talking to people I know who work in these sorts of environments, where do you have the PKI in, uh, like that, uh, the Navy, for example, anytime something like that happens, it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, and the government can do things like that that a private company can't do, too. But it, it does change things. So it's a little harder that way. It, it, it's harder in the sense of you don't have a password like yeah. that. But. Thank you. So the reason I really liked Huimu was you could take memory snapshots without having to alter the memory before uh, taking the snapshot. So you like load it up. Like the thing, have you tested Secure Doc ever? Uh, Disk encryption. No. Yeah, so you can actually, if you boot up to a live CD, you can set the Huimu to boot off the hard disk instead, and it'll load the uh, secure, the pre-boot authentication into memory into a small virtual machine that you can persist to disk. You can take a snapshot of, of its exact state, whatever disk, a USB drive or something like that. That's and cool. then you can use like strings or you can do any type of file. You can carve the file system because it's a RAM disk. So you carve the file system out of the snapshot and then you can just peruse it and get to the slash, et cetera, slash shadow, all that kind of stuff. And I was able, I was able to get to the root hashes uh, and only crack one of them for the secure doc stuff. but. There, this one also had a, if you pressed F12, you can get a web browser and pretty good authentication. <laughs> so, what was that called? Secure Doc. Yeah, don't use it. <laughs> Those people who are in concrete boxes with uh, Faraday cages are not completely insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Have you uh, have you used VMware to do any like pre-boot authentication attacks? Meaning, if the pre-boot authentication is not there, you take let's say BitLocker, uh -huh. and you have a usable disk that's not dependent on. Okay, BitLocker is on VPN, but 
You take something that's not on GPM. TrueCrypt, for example. TrueCrypt. Boot into a Windows, okay, fine, DMA doesn't work. Have you had? Have you been able to use VMware to boot that disk into VMware and just copy the VMEM file out of that? Or the VMEM file is basically a snapshot of RAM. Yeah. So you can... Uh, ha have you had to use VMware in any situation to do this? Not, not for some of these. Um, but that being said, that definitely the same approach that you do on a physical machine would be full of uh, difference being it's a lot easier to work with. So uh, and the, the techniques would be very simple. Yes. How do you feel about Kukrit? I think that it's a good product for what it offers, but that being said, uh, there are ways to configure it poorly. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it, that, it, anything we deal with, let, let's just say you, you buy a firewall. Uh, we've got a firewall, first rule, any, any except. You have a firewall, it's a router. Same thing for like TrueCrypt. You could uh, deploy it and have a really bad pass break. So then uh, make the, the prop that comes up, password is password. <laughs> So, if anyone wants to chat about anything afterwards, uh, hit me up. I'll, where is it? Um, there's a Q, there'll be a Q&A session down by the stairs, uh, underneath the stairs. Uh, <laughs> they're going to hide you. Right. They don't want you to. There's a room underneath the stairs. It's really close in my um, It's below the escalators as you came up to the conference center. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and if anyone wants to follow me and chat about more. I'm about to walk down the Everyone, thank you for us uh, attending. It's always good to have a good audience for us for